Welcome to our panel on the road to autonomous vehicles. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, we have like the four of us will talk a little bit about the regulatory framework when it comes to autonomous vehicles. There are some very recent developments uh, on the EU level, but also in the various countries. And we will particularly speak about France and Germany today. Um, let me briefly introduce, if it works, the panel. No, it doesn't. Right? Do you see the same that I do? That's not the panel. Sorry? Is that okay? No? Okay. So we'll do it without that. I try again. The green one, yes? I did click on green. Okay, it's, it's not a big thing. It's okay. You can do it for me if you want. Ah, beautiful. So, thank you. Um, so, my name is Patrick Ayert. I'm the um, global leader for mobility and transportation at Hogan Novels, which comprises basically three industry sectors, automotive, transport, logistics, and then also aerospace and defense. Uh, with me on the left side, Christelle Coslin. She's a partner in our Paris office, focusing on litigation, product liability, class action, so all the bad things that can happen particularly also with autonomous vehicles, hopefully not. Then we have Charlotte Leroux, uh, a counsel in our Paris office as well, focusing on commercial regulatory issues and also very much involved in uh, AV developments. And last but not least, Sebastian Polly, our uh, product liability, product safety, product compliance partner uh, from Germany uh, with me in Munich. So that's the panel for today. And before we start, I want to make a, a quick poll Two questions when it comes to autonomous vehicles. And, and we're talking about fully automated vehicles. So I'm talking about like the vehicles where you don't have to interfere at all as a driver. So I'm talking about level four. And I think you will be familiar with the level. So level four, um, autonomous vehicles. What do you think? When will we have the first autonomous vehicles fully deployed, serious deployment, commercialized on the road? I give you... Let's say five choices, or let, let's make it like three choices. This year, 2024, 2026, and never. So, this year. Ah, two, three people, very good. 2024-ish. A little bit more. 2026-ish. Ah, almost more. And then, who says never? Oh, there's one. <laughs> okay, that's like... Okay, very good. So I don't know if you know, like the IAA Mobility last year in, in, in Munich in September, uh, Mobileye, the Intel company, together with Sixt, announced to have autonomous vehicles um, commercialized, fully deployed in Munich uh, this year, towards the end of this year. So there are ambitions to do that. Whether this will happen, we will see. Well, next question. What is the biggest barrier for autonomous vehicles to be fully deployed, in your view? I give you, again, three or four choices. The first would be technical requirements. The second would be regulatory framework. The third would be, let's say, consumer uh, perception, like consumer acceptance. Is there a fourth one we can think of? Technical, legal, consumer, political barriers or something. Right? Although this goes hand in hand with the regulatory framework. So let, let's do the three. And, and, and let's, the, the fourth one would be other. And then you can tell us what it is. So, uh, regulatory framework. Quite a few. Uh, technical requirements. Okay. Uh, consumer perception. Oh, only one. Okay. And then other? And what would it be? So if you raise your hand, you have to say something now. Which means that no one is raising their hand. So, okay. So, let's start with uh, the discussion here. Thanks, thanks for contributing. And, and whenever you have a question or a comment or so, or you want to come here and sit, there is a free chair, then please come and discuss with us. So, when we talk about the regulatory framework for autonomous vehicles, we have to um, distinguish different layers, basically, uh, from a regulatory framework. We have, like, the UN level. Uh, on the United Nations level, there are some laws and regulations, particularly regarding technical requirements uh, for vehicles and safety requirements. And work is being done also on that level when it comes to autonomous vehicles. Um, specifically, when we talk about Europe, we have a, 
uh, EU type approval system. So every car needs a type approval. And it gets, like the manufacturer gets the type approval in France, for example, and then it is valid for the whole EU. So this is also where we would need to work on and we are currently working on. Um, and then, of course, we have a national level and we may even have a municipal or local level when it comes to the deployment of these vehicles in a certain city or area or whatever. And that makes it quite complex, I can tell you. And, and we are also often struggling and um, we will talk about the interaction also, for example, on the EU level and uh, the national level. And why is that? We now have a draft ADS, Automated uh, Driving Systems Regulation, on the table on the EU level. It is currently being discussed. It is, it, it is introduced to the public now. There is a stakeholder consultation going on for this. It was discussed among the member states. There were some also stakeholders from the industry who were um, involved in these discussions. So something is on the table right now. And uh, we can talk a little bit about this also later. Um, maybe Sebastian, uh, you know, we have also been involved in, in this exercise with our white paper. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Definitely, Patrick. So um, I think, Patrick, you together with others over there, there is Lance, our global director of thought leadership and others are spearheading a lot of initiatives. And um, we've just recently published one of our Hogan Lovells white papers. If you're interested in having, having a copy, let us know. Um, this is part of our thought leadership process and how we how we support what we believe is right to, to enable getting automated vehicles on the roads, of course, as swiftly as possible, but also as safe as necessary, as reliable as necessary to get consumer buy-in. Um, and if you're interested in having a copy, just let us know. We're, we're more than happy to share. Charlotte, you've also been involved, so do you want to add a few things? Just from, a few words. Why we did this white paper is because we had many like legal regimes that were going on in Germany, in UK, in France, and we wanted to mark a pose and to see in which direction we were going, to see if we were all going the same direction, because we know that we will, we will be just a, a difficult stage if everyone is going in different direction. We need to have a uniform vision of the, of the regulatory regime and constraints. And so uh, this is why we are making like a, a parallel bef between the different legal regime that we have. And I think it's quite key to, to look at it to see if uh, there's anything that we should add on it. Yeah, I think the most important point here, I mean, we all have a common goal. We want to have, I guess, we want to have these vehicles on the road. And I think we will all only achieve this if we all work together and collaborate. First of all, the industry, the te technicians, the politicians, you unfortunately also need lawyers um, to, to, to get the rules out there um, and the legislator, of course, in the first instance. So this was basically the reason why we did that. And, and we want to talk a little bit more about particularly what's happening on the EU level. But first of, the, first of all, we could see that in, in the various countries and particularly in France, Germany and also in parts in, in the UK, there, are already, uh, there is already a law on some sort of automation. Starting, of course, we are in France, in Paris, with uh, France. Um, Charlotte, tell us a little bit about the legislative efforts in France. What I could say first is that we could be proud of France because we were one of the leaders of, uh, in implementing regulations on uh, AVs. But if we go deep down on the regulation, just two, two words. Um, Patrick Ayer was mentioning the different layers that we have, the technical, we have the driving rules. On the technical side in France, we don't have much that is published and the regulation does not regulate. We're only saying that AVs should have should be in type approved before and then we will have safety rules that will come this year and next year. So we're still, uh, still at the initial stage in terms of type approval rules in France. Of course, we will be regulated by the EU, but we still need our own. And uh, another point is the French regime that uh, this two last year, we had many regulations that went on and uh, it's making a big distinction between the ordinary regime and the transport, public transport regime. And uh, when you, the, the difference is, is quite huge is uh, on, on the ordinary regime, we can only go on the level three and on the transport, public transport is level four. What's the difference between level three and level four? Do you all know that? You can briefly explain. If I briefly explain, it's level three. Usually we say that human intervention is necessary in some cases. Level four, it can happen, but it's not necessary. It means that manufacturers are able either to implement 
and ask human driver to intervene, or they can uh, never ask the human, the human driver to intervene. This will really depend on the manufacturer's uh, system. And level five will never have human intervention. And so when we come back to that, we can say on the level three, it's only for the ordinary regime. So when I was asked by clients, can we implement this solution in front at this stage on uh, where we don't have any human intervention? It's not possible. Either you're going on the public transport or we have the testing regime in France that allows that, but only in some specific roads that you have to plan before the authority. So the only way to build something like in your system, to try your system is on the testing regime in France. And, and of course, we, 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 use, we are used to help clients to build all these uh, fights before them. So this is one or two words. And I think uh, Christelle would then talk about the liability regime, which is quite important to see who's going to be liable. And you're also going to have a word about it. But this is all I want to say in France about the regime now. Thank you very much. And we'll get to the liability point uh, soon. Um, so just to summarize, so maybe it's fair to say that France was indeed the first country to uh, have a legislation for L4, uh, but limited, as you said, uh, for transportation purposes. Yeah. Like and transportation of person, of not people, people, yeah, people systems. Exactly. Right. Um, now, what about Germany? They were the first to have some laws around this area, and and there is some recent development. Right, Patrick. And let me let me mirror what Charlotte just said. I mean. Definitely, France can be proud of, of what it was and is doing in the automotive field. And I think it's very healthy competition amongst the member states, which again is something I extremely appreciate. Like, like Patrick said, I'm, I'm from Germany, um, which does not mean that I don't appreciate the French approach, quite the opposite. I think it's very good that, that France is moving forward there. Um, to Patrick's point, where we stand in Germany at the moment, um, looking back at the poll question you did at the beginning, um, some of you said, well, there might be serious deployment this year for level four. Some said what might be showstopper. Some lifted their hand when it comes to regulatory rules, lawmaking. So the German point that, that you're making, Patrick, is absolutely right. In 2017, for example, Germany first introduced a law allowing type approval and serious deployment for level three. Now, this year, 2022, it's on the agenda to have, and that's the healthy competition, also a level four law in Germany, but not limited in any way, but allowing level four serious deployment once this law is through. And then, I mean, the basic questions will be to obtain the respective type approval. Of course, everybody in the corporations needs to agree that what we're placing on the market is safe and that this level of safety we're seeing is safe enough. But once the law is passed, and that will happen in the course of 2022, um, it's possible to do it in Germany. And again, I think it's very healthy competition amongst the member states, and I'm very eager to see how, how other member states will follow suit once the first markets show that this kind of serious deployment is both from a legal perspective, but also technologically possible and, and happening. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and as you say, um, it will come soon, probably in the next month or so. I mean, it's in the final stages of the legislative process. Just very quickly, um, there are basically three steps to get this approval. The first is like the uh, type approval for the ve vehicle that, that we all know for every vehicle. There will be a special type approval, so to say, for the automated uh, driving system. Um, uh, so, so that's a special approval. And then you need a third approval wherever you are operating these vehicles. So it's a sort of municipal level for, for the ODD, the operating design domain. So what are the boundary conditions of this uh, autonomous vehicle, like the typical L4 question? And, and that is a municipal or local uh, question. So there will be different authorities uh, also uh, be dealing with this. Well, it's funny actually when you see yourself here. But anyway, um, so, so this is coming. Um, and uh, it seems that we are ready there. We will talk about the interaction between what we see on the national level and then on the EU level. And I was also talking with someone who is here sitting there in, in the audience about this just before. We will get back to this point. Before that, you already raised that point, liability. So uh, starting again with uh, France, um, don't we need a new liability law before we think about, you know, introducing uh, autonomous vehicles from a type approval perspective? Don't we need new liability laws? 
Well, that's a very good question, Patrick. I think since France shows a, a two-step approach, first regulating the test period and the question is really twofold from a French perspective, meaning that what we have right now uh, in the framework Charlotte was discussing is criminal liability governing the rules on testing of L4 on the roads now that we have uh, L4 vehicles on the roads. But there's a much bigger question uh, which relates to what will happen when series deployment of L4 uh, will, will have taken place and what liability rules will apply. And actually this question is not only pending at France or Germany level, but it's also a big EU question. Uh, and I think if you only remember one key thing I will tell you is that as part of the regulatory framework, the question is also about our product liability rules in general. And for the last, I would say, half a decade, or maybe even more, Sebastian, you can correct me, but we have been discussing what are the future roles for product liability, because this takes place in a much wider debate about new tech products, AI in general. How do we regulate liability for this type of products? Also taking into account the safety concerns we were referring at the very beginning of our conversation. What level of safety consumers will want to have? Well, general trends is that they want the top safety possible. They're not accepting any risk anymore, which is, of course, quite difficult to uh, reconcile with the idea that we have high-tech products being put on the market, including ADS on L4 vehicles. So, and so to to tell you in two words, because this discussion has been ongoing in Europe for last, at least five years, they are still not completely decided. The European Commission is still working on that. Working groups after working groups, and, and you also have a specific framework for artificial intelligence being put in place in parallel. So just to tell you, it's quite complicated, but we will have some rules at the end of the day, and they're still uh, being deployed at the same time vehicles are being deployed. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think your reference to the AI legal framework is very important because if you read through that, there, there are a lot of references to autonomous vehicles as well. So this goes hand in hand. And there are some plans really to, to have some, you know, um, guaranteed liability, so to say, just because it's an artificial um, intelligence uh, driven vehicle uh, or with AI and whatever. Um, Sebastian, from your perspective, we've been discussing, discussing this also quite extensively. Um, what about new laws? And maybe you could also um, uh, briefly comment on the insurance aspects of autonomous vehicles. Right. So um, new laws on the liability side and coming back to Patrick's original question and then what's happening, um, there are, of course, a lot of liability rules already in existence. And I mean, I'm not just a lawyer. I'm not just looking at these things from a professional perspective. I'm also a user. I'm also a customer. So you will never hear me say, look, we don't need liability rules. And um, my personal opinion, however, is they need to be balanced. They need to be reasonable. They need to allow companies, mindful, responsible companies, to place those products on the market. And um, what we're seeing development-wise is that there are a lot of new concepts that people try to introduce when it comes to liability for AVs. And... Um, I must say, at the moment, I'm very skeptical regarding many of these concepts that are being introduced. There is one trend that is both coming from the aviation industry and from the life sciences and drug industry, where they try to think about, about um, s introducing certain numbers of fatalities that, that might be acceptable. To me, it sounds like a risk-benefit approach. And don't get me wrong, but um, I think it's important that those who who work closely with the engineers in the automotive industry, but also those who use the products. A car is not an airplane, and an AV is not an airplane, and a car and an AV is also not, not a drug. Uh, an AV does not have side effects. There is no risk-benefit ratio. Um, so it's not like a painkiller where you say you're in pain, you take the drug, you get better, the pain goes, but you'll have side effects. And this amount of people will have side effects, and we'll have clinical trials and ethical studies, and I'm, I'm not seeing this happening. At the same time, all the aviation concepts we're seeing, I'm not fully convinced because if you look how the aviation development life cycles work, how redundancy in the aviation industry works, double, triple redundant systems, I'm not sure if this is what we need in the auto industry right now to transform cars into how we look at airplanes. 
And um, this is just examples. On the insurance side, uh, just to briefly touch that, a lot of things are obviously happening. For the insurance industry, AVs are a big opportunity. And um, with maybe a shift in liability from drivers who make driving errors, drunk drivers, people who fall asleep while driving, to autonomous systems who won't have these issues, but that might maybe face other challenges, the whole insurance way of looking at things is obviously changing as the liability may shift from the driver, the holder, the owner, to the operator or the manufacturer. And again, I'm more than happy to go into, into any detail, but I think in summary, those are the main developments we're seeing at the moment. Uh, two points on what you said. First of all, you sometimes when you do the presentations on this topic, you use a slide which I think is very nice, where you can see that there are, uh, of course, there will be more accidents based on machines, uh, on, on machine failure and not human failure, but overall, it will go down. Can you maybe briefly comment on that? Yeah, so what, what, what we are seeing, and I don't have specific numbers, but I think that's not the point. Let's roughly say the vast majority of accidents we're seeing right now is caused by human error, by driver error. And this is somewhere beyond 90, some say 98%, but you know, don't quote me on the number, whoever has exact numbers, but this number will obviously go down. The more autonomous systems we have, the more driving assistant, but also level three, obviously with level four, it's a completely different story. This number will go down. So the overall number of accidents goes down and obviously the number of accidents triggered by driving errors will go down, but at the same time, the number of accidents that is linked to alleged vehicle defects, that will climb. And um, this is something that the industry is aware of that is a necessity. I think it's to some degree inevitable. It, it will happen. So overall, the number of incidents goes down, but those that we'll see, this liability will shift from all of us as drivers who will make errors to the industry and then eventually also to insurers and other insurers. So good for all of us because the number of accidents will go down. It did go down already. It will go down further, but the liability will shift. Yes. Okay. So, and, and I guess also this will uh, uh, trigger a shift also from an insurance perspective, like, you know, who, who needs to insure. Um, so, so we will see that. Now you mentioned, and, and let's talk a little bit about the EU draft, which is, um, you know, introducing the idea of a fatali sort of fatality requirement or rate uh, when it comes to autonomous vehicles, which is new to the uh, automotive world. Um, how do you see that? Maybe also, Christelle, I mean, this, this is an interesting development. You know, my concern is, how do people perceive that? Uh, if, if we're talking about a fatality in terms of, well, well th these kinds of accidents, they, they are acceptable. Uh, but 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 not more. Um, I mean, yes, we have that in in the in the pharmaceutical industry, and we have it to a certain extent in the in, in the aerospace or aircraft. But how do you see that with with vehicles? It's not something we've been discussing in France or Germany during the legislative process. So it's really coming from the EU. Well, that <clears throat> that makes me think of studies that have been out in terms of. It, it could be that one of the main hurdles for AV to be on the road is actually consumers not being willing to, to have them. You know, many drivers still want to have their hands on, on the drive and driving their own vehicles. And so the question may be on technical issues, regulatory question is, are there, is there a market? How big is the market? So I think this raises this big question because I think talking about fatality rates means accepting there will be fatalities and I'm not sure we as customers we're ready to accept that risk um, so and, and uh, you, Sebastian was right that it's also a concept quite foreign to our legal traditions uh, in the product liability world for automotive vehicles so far so I don't know how this will really fit in the global framework of product laws in, in general right yes and now let's talk uh, also about this interaction now. It, it seems that the EU is coming up with new ideas. Uh, in, in, in some ways, uh, France and Germany really uh, took the lead, paved the way for a regulatory framework on autonomous vehicles. And certainly the EU is also looking at what France, Germany, and, and maybe even the UK does just to see what's going on there, um, which raises now the question of, we have some laws in France and Germany 
We're now introducing some was, uh, something in, on the EU level, but I can tell you it's with a limited scope. Um, it's, it's introducing like small series of, of AVs and then like special vehicles, but it's not like the full scope as we have, for example, for people mover systems or like the really full scope in Germany. And now the question is, can we still go ahead in France and Germany if we are not ready yet on the EU level. So we will likely have something, I think, by July on the EU level, but it will be limited to, for example, small series. And now the question is, in Germany, we go beyond that. Can we do it at least in Germany? And I can tell you, and we've been discussing this, we have the EU policy manager from Argo AI, which is a very important ADS developer. Um, uh, we've been discussing this. There are conflicting views. We did a webinar two weeks ago uh, with uh, some stakeholders, some policy makers. Um, I'm not quite sure if I should mention names now, but, but anyway, well, it's public knowledge anyway. So there was Richard Damm, who is the president at KBA and also the working chair uh, of the UN Working Group on Autonomous Connected Vehicles. And he was, of course, involved in the German legislative process and said, yeah, of course we can do that for Germany uh, because it's just in Germany. Of course, the vehicles cannot cross the border then. They cannot drive to France, but in Germany we can do that. There was one representative from the EU who also seemed to take that position. That's fine to do it in the, in the national countries. But I, I think you said that like Anthony Legrange, who is like the super headmaster of all these EU developments, um, like the, you know, the, for, for the legislative framework, he seemed to suggest that this is not the case. And, and so uh, the, the national, uh, the, the countries, the member states would not uh, be able to do that, which is why there is currently a discussion whether there should be a sort of opening clause, as you said, uh, regarding this issue. So this remains to be seen. If you want to lobby for one or the other direction, please do so. Uh, there is the stakeholder consultation now, and, and we need to see. I mean, from, uh, from a French-German perspective, how do we see that uh, as a lawyer? I mean, if someone asks us, uh, what do we represent? Which, which opinion? <laughs> I go first. Yeah. So, um... When it comes to the to the opinions, and I'm more than happy to take this offline in detail, um, <laughs> but obviously we're we're one of the leading automotive law firms, and for those who know Hogan Lovells, you know who our clients are. But at, like I said to Patrick, at the same time, I'm I'm also I'm also a consumer. I'm also getting into these cars, and I want to get safe from A to B. So the the positions we are taking is a very reasonable one. I believe, and um, to your specific point, to Germany, and like I said before, I think it's, it's good that Germany is making this move, that it is brave, and I personally appreciate that a lot of our clients and also others in the industry seem to be, it's about to be seen, but I think it's, it's, it's upcoming, seem to be brave enough to, to take this next step. And like Patrick said at the beginning, um, there are some at IAA who already announced that they will have level four fleets and that they will do this. And whether they can cross the border now or not, I think it's not so much an issue. I firmly believe it can be done in Germany. It's legal to do it. Um, the law is about to be passed. Everybody's ready. Um, we are happy to support the business however we can. And so my personal opinion is it's the right thing to do. It's the right move um, to be bold and brave. Yes. I mean, nobody is, should, be, um, should be reckless, but everything I see isn't reckless. It's very mindful. It's very well considered, very well balanced. And I think we're, we're there to make the next move. Would you support that from a French perspective? <laughs> I had a conversation a uh, long time ago with a global head of uh, insurance company that I won't name. And uh, we were talking about cybersecurity insurance for autonomous vehicles. So this is another layer of fear in terms of autonomous vehicles. And he was saying, and you remember this person, he was saying, well, we should be crazy to get into autonomous vehicles and into autonomous uh, planes. So I was quite worried about, because he was the one selling insurance for that, but he was the one who didn't want to get inside. So I was really thinking about and going through. But we're going through with the, our clients on the safety measures and we know that it will be step by step. We have a testing regime in France and it, it proves that it's efficient in a way and that the, the technology is getting better and better. So this is why we have this regime. So. I'm quite confident in the future of autonomous vehicles for that. And I hope that we will have because it's, it's really easy to get the car and go to your countryside house with a 
drinking two glasses of wine. So I'm really hoping that we're going to have autonomous vehicles system uh, developed in uh, soon, very soon. And w one thing that I want to clarify, because I think now everyone agrees on that, and this was also a reason uh, for our white paper was, you know, um, the, the question, particularly when you think about ADS developers, there, there will be situations out there, business models, where someone purchases vehicles that are not autonomous, but then puts like the ADS system on top. And I think our position was that everyone who basically wants to assume responsibility for these vehicles can also be the one who is considered a manufacturer and can bring these vehicles on, on the market. And there was some confusion about the term vehicle manufacturer, which appeared in the German uh, draft uh, legislation, but then it also appeared on the EU level. And we basically also with the white paper tried to uh, push against that. Um, and, and I think they removed all the references to vehicle manufacturer. So it's not just the traditional vehicle manufacturer. It can also be an ADS developer who introduces an autonomous vehicle on the market, provided that uh, this manufacturer uh, assumes regulatory responsibility and also um, proves that the car is safe with a safety concept and whatsoever. And I think that's the good, the good thing. Now, you, 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 you briefly mentioned cybersecurity, which also brings us in, into the data question. And I want to talk a little bit also about, uh, you know, class actions and, and whatever, when it, particularly when it comes to data and cybersecurity. But tell us um, uh, from, a, from a, like, the, the whole issue of data and autonomous vehicles, a, a very open question. What, what are your thoughts on that? First, we have, we have already regulations that are regulated connected vehicles. And we have other layers now for automated vehicles, which are different and, and can be both at the same time. So we have at the EU side, on the EU side, we also have on the UN side, and we have on the French side. We have new regulations in France now regulating autonomous vehicles. Um, but just in short, the, the issue that we're facing is that we have GDPR, and everyone is annoyed by this for this acronym, but GDPR is regulating hardly uh, the data. But... Uh, autonomous vehicles are not only producing personal data, they are producing other um, data. And they are also now regulated in France by the new cybersecurity regime. So we have another layer that is created in terms of uh, notification to be made by the manufacturers. So this adds really complexity to, to manufacturers of ADS, of the whole vehicle, because they have to think about all the different layers, all the different uh, constraints that they have. Uh, and so um, I think in terms of data now, the industry is really dramatically changing data. The, all the cars are making data. And we really also at this stage, we have to uniform regulation in, within Europe, not to have only the French specific regime that we have nowadays. I hope that our German team, uh, German uh, and UK, and they will follow the same regime, or at least we will find something that will be really close to the, the French rules uh, today. Yeah, and, and I can tell you, I just got a query recently on, on ALKS, Automated Lane Keeping Systems, where we talk about L2 or maybe L3, L2 in this case. Um, there, there are laws on that, also on a UN level, like, um, and, and, and there was a type approval now for, for such system in Germany, like the first. Thank you, five minutes. Um, and so the question was here, there are some retention requirements regarding the data for these systems. And uh, quite interestingly, uh, references made uh, to, to, to the national legislator when it comes to that. And now a client was asking, well, but what do we do if one country says you have to retain the data for three years, the other says five years? Okay, so you retain it for five years, but what if the one country says, and after three years you have to delete it because of GDPR issues or whatsoever? So we need harmonization here. So how can we design a system that drives in all these countries if these requirements from a data perspective are not clear. So there is a lot of confusion. It's, it's very complex and we will have more confusion there. That's an issue that we're already facing with GDPR is like clients have sometimes five, three years and we, we're trying to make our own rules which, which can prove then to the authority that we're trying to do the right things. But it's right. And, there's, and also the main question will be access to data. Who can access the data? And insurance is also a key issue for that. And who can have access to the data? And you also have a layer between the manufacturer of the car, the manufacturer of the, the ADS, and the authorities, and the insurance. So uh, it will be a, a big war on that, a big fight. Speaking about wars. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> we have another three minutes Very or good so. Very segue. Uh, cyber security. Um, and of course, the risks. Um, what do you expect from a litigation perspective and particularly also, you know, class action perspective. Uh, we, at the moment, it's still very much around uh, emissions issues, right? Uh, also in France, we can see that in the UK now, in Germany for many years. Is like, are autonomous vehicles the next target of plaintiff lawyers and, and, and then also, you know, cybersecurity? Is, is this what you expect? Yes. I think everything... Uh, The arrival of uh, Air Force vehicles arrive at the same time as, as many developments in the legal systems that we are seeing in Europe at the moment. So just to be very concrete and try to categorize the risk we're going to be facing, there's a B2C side. On the B2C side, uh, one of the key questions will be, indeed, in case of accident, access to the data, Charlotte was referring to, because this data will be key to also determine whether there's any room for consumers' liability in terms of how the vehicle, the vehicle was operated. But it will also be key for B2B disputes between the vehicle manufacturer, but the ADS manufacturer, maybe a company operating the maintenance of the vehicle. So, you know, there is a lot of room. And one overall characteristic all of that is the complexity of this dispute. And this is going to be a game changer compared to what we know already. On the procedural side, and you're right to mention in class actions, I would rather use the word collective actions because class actions is actually a tiny bit of the global picture in that respect. But that means a group of consumers suing all together. We've had a legal regime for that purpose in France for the last eight years. It has not been completely successful in terms of class actions, but collective actions. We hear about them all the time. Hundreds of people gathered by a plaintiff counsel, going after, in, going after a manufacturer to allege liability. Well, this is there to stay. This is a trend that will only continue to rise. And any alleged defect in series will give rise to major issues and potential liability risks and litigation. Sebastian, maybe you want to add uh, to this from a, I don't know, German or whatever thoughts you have. Sure. Perspective. Uh, sure. Uh, I'm First of all, I fully, I fully agree. Maybe a very simple concept. When we talk about plaintiff lawyers, I mean, there's a simple rule. They follow the money. And when you think about the, the slide that Patrick brought up before, we said, look, the overall number of accidents, they will go down. Um, accidents were a very profitable field for plaintiff lawyers. And it never really affected the industry because there were drunk drivers. It was didn't matter for the industry. But now that the overall number is down, they lose a lot of business. But there is another thing on the rise, and those are the accidents being triggered by alleged product defects. And um, that is something they will focus on. And the interesting thing there is, again, they follow the money. The pockets of a drunk driver are not particularly deep, but the pockets of the companies who are currently working on placing those products on the market, and that will eventually succeed in doing though, those might be extremely deep. And this is a trend we will see in the member states, we'll see it on a European level, we'll most certainly see it on a global scale. And to add on what you said before, um, I mean, it's not a secret that, that we are defending a lot of, a lot of um, great companies in the market um, when it comes to also emissions topics. Those plaintiffs, those that attack the industry, they learned a lot in the last years, and they are looking for the next big thing to come. And AVs, in my view, will be one of those hot topics that can be very profitable and therefore very interesting for them. Yes. And I think it's okay. So it's, it's on. I just want the final point also with the data and the liability, and, and you are always making this point. You, you can collect a lot of data, But that also means you have some responsibility. You have to maybe then look into the data and act if you find out that something is wrong. So the data is good to collect, but it also gives you some responsibility from a liability perspective. This is also quite important. So I think we run out of time. Is that right? Is there any like final comment or question that you want to say? There is still the, the, the chair is still empty. Yes, someone. Can we take this What, last? Yeah. Thank you very much. Hello. Yeah. Thank you for Bonjour. the panel. Bonjour. Um, 
in my understanding is uh, in the US, there's almost half of all the states which have full ADS regulation in place today for at least level four. Are we not very late now in Europe? Uh, sorry, late? Uh, so uh, to, to have a regulation in Europe, which are is uh, similar to the US. Oh, sorry. Are we late in terms oh. of level? We are level four, but are we late in Europe? Are we late in Europe? Regulation. I think we are even later in the US if I look at my US friend. Um, no, I, I actually do think that we are quite advanced, and particularly France and Germany. I think we can be proud in France and Germany that we took it that far, and on the EU level we are somewhat late. And, and, and certainly now also because we limit the scope of application to small series and special purpose vehicles or, or shuttle services. I don't know what, what it is exactly. We, we need to look into this, but I don't think we are late. I think Europe is doing well, uh, at least France and Germany in particular. And also the UK is quite advanced. And we can see just one last thing that U.S. is still making their own rules because we had a report from the U.S. authority two days ago that was published giving new rules or maybe established rules on AVs. So it's still something that people are thinking about. U.S. is great at testing, far, far ahead, like with, you know, all the, the Waymos, the Argo AIs and whatever. They do great testing. But when it comes to serious deployment, I think Europe is, is, is ahead of, of the curve. And I think for any further questions, we'll take them at our booth because I think we are done. Yeah, we have okay. coffee. Sorry, we have to. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And thank you for this great panel. Thank you. Thank you.